if you're talking to a coach and you definitely don't want to go there, you always got to be respectful because you don't know who that coach knows, right? Like he can know somebody two, three, four levels higher. The guy calls you and like, what do you think about this guy? And I was like, well, you know, this happened when I was recruiting him. And, and so you never know what's going to happen. So you always, like you said, it's important to be professional with everybody you talk to and wherever they're at, right? Because you don't know what's going to happen down the road. You don't know who people know. And I think it's super important. What's going on guys? This is Brian from Advancement Hockey Advising here. Today we got a really special interview here with Kevin Cole. Now for those of you who don't know Kevin, I actually know him super well. He's a coach that coached at Trine University back when I played there. So I actually got to know Kevin quite well. We've stayed in touch throughout the years, especially since I transitioned to advising and he transitioned into coaching. Now he's actually coaching at the NCAA D3 level at Norwich, which is a really prestigious program that you guys probably have all heard of. I think you guys are going to get a ton of value out of this as to how they recruit, you know, what they look for in hockey players and all all that kind of stuff so hopefully you guys get a ton of value out of this if you like these kind of videos absolutely destroy that like button it goes a really long way for the algorithm and for other people to see these kind of videos also too if you're new here consider hitting that subscribe button and notification bell so you never miss another video moving forward all right guys without further ado here let's dive right into the interview here with kevin all right so kevin glad to have you here how are you doing today doing great thanks for having me excited to uh be on on the show awesome well glad to have you as well i guess we can just start off and kick it off with, uh, you know, maybe telling the audience a little bit about yourself, you know, your hockey background, your coaching background and stuff like that. Okay. Yeah. I started, uh, I'm from Michigan. So I played uh, AAA in Michigan. I played in the North American Hockey League for juniors. You know, then I had a couple walk-on opportunities for D1. I tried those out. They didn't, didn't work out the way I wanted to. So I ended up going and just finishing school at Michigan State after that back in my hometown. So that was my hockey background. My my coaching, I, I got started kind of late. I I had, you know, nine to five regular job for 10 or 15 years after high school, got back into hockey, was able to be an assistant coach for one year and then went to Trine as a head coach and, and I helped with the NCAA team with skills. And then I moved on to Purdue Northwest in the ACHA and now I'm at Norwich for an assistant coach out here for last year's my first year, second year coming up now. Yeah, and that's actually, you coached at Trine, that's how we met and uh, got to know each other pretty well. So um, so you coach at the the ACHA level, you've coached now at the NCAA B3 level in a really good NCAA B3 program. So what's what's the recruiting process like, you know, ACHA compared to NCAA? What are the differences? So I think the, I think the biggest difference maybe is the level that you come from the level you play at and and maybe the expectations we have depending on what level we're at so you know depending on what level I mean you need to be open to to both ideas right like know that your goal may be NCAA but you may fall and, and play ACHA which now it's getting really good I mean ACHA D1 there's there's a lot of really good teams out there so I think for recruiting purposes is just trying to find find the families and, and the players that are open to the idea of both and and are realistic in their expectations of where they should end up and you know when you're recruiting and stuff what what do you look for you know in terms of on-ice skill or maybe like the three on-ice skills that you look for particularly in players I think the first thing we look for is are you are you a smart player do you know where to be and if you can do those things that are like team things and you're smart and you're willing to to work and learn that's the biggest thing you look for the the skating the you know the skill stuff some of that stuff can be taught some of that stuff can I mean, you could be a 20 goal scorer and and not be a skill guy but you can crash the net you can be in front you can do do stuff in the dirty areas and i think that's the i think that's the the second thing is like being willing to go into the corners willing to be in front of the net and if you're smart and you're willing to do that and you're willing to play defense those are the three things we look for yeah for sure and i think time and time again between skating and like being smart or high hockey iq those are the top two that coaches really really bring up because it's true if you can't can't think the game there's not really much you can do out there right there, there's guys that i've seen that really great skaters good skills but then you put them in a game situation they don't really accomplish much you know so yeah for sure uh, yeah i see a lot of coaches bringing up the the hockey iq aspect you know maybe moving away from on ice skills more on the off ice side of things what are some maybe some character traits that you look for in a player you know when you call up a coach Traits, I think being driven and being a hard worker. I mean, those are those are big ones. And if you want to put in the time away from the rink, you want to put in the time at the rink, you know, you can you can really accomplish a lot by just doing the 
the little things and putting the extra effort in. Uh, the biggest thing that I think though, is being a, being like a team guy, right? Like you want to be a genuine person that is there to help their teammates. They're a good person off the ice. They go to class. They do, they're a well-rounded person. And I think when you get those people, those are the type of, of player that's willing to learn, that's willing to do the little thing for their teammate, that's willing to do the little thing to help win a game. You know, that's really the thing that we look for the most is will he fit in with our team culture? Is he a good person on and off the ice or represent the university in the right way? And, you know, when you find a bunch of those guys and you become you know, close, a close unit on and off the ice, you really can excel as a team on the ice throughout the whole season. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I, I've seen like from being on teams that had a lot of skill, but just didn't have that chemistry or good team guys, you know, the leadership, all that aspect, hard workers, that they didn't have that. We didn't do as well as teams that were maybe less skilled, but that had all those off ice components. I, I felt like we succeeded a lot better. So it's, a lot of people don't realize this, but it's a big, big aspect of the game that coaches really look for. How do you go about weeding out players that might not have that or finding players that really do have that? What are the things you do to, to see, oh yeah, this guy's a, a good team guy? How do you know? I guess in recruiting process, when you're watching a player on the ice, I think we've talked about it in the past, like you think somebody's going to be good or you think that you've got a lot of good, a lot of good on that kid. That, and you go to watch the game and he's he's lazy or he doesn't make the the little the little place happen and so that would be like a red flag on the ice for me like why doesn't this person want to go into those areas or why isn't this person back checking or kind of like fake back checking right and i think off the ice right like when you talk to somebody you ask them some of these questions about like being a good teammate and about being a good person in the community and how do you interact with your teammates and then even going a step further and and talking to some of those teammates and talking to their their families and talking to their coaches. And, and that's what I like to do. I, I like to get a big background on them and say, you know, are all these people saying good things about you? Are all these people who don't have to say anything good about you want you to succeed too? And I think when you combine those two things, the actions on the ice, you know, talking to a few different people off the ice. And I think a lot of times that you're going to end up with a guy on your team currently and you're going to recruit, they know somebody you're recruiting. They're going to tell you, hey, coach, this guy is great. He's an awesome teammate, loves being with the guys, great off the ice. They're going to be like, no, like when I play with them, he did this, this, and this. And I don't know if we want that type of person around. So you never know when somebody's watching. You never know you know, what your actions are going to say a year down the road or two, to, two years down the road. So it's really about being that person that can be a teammate on and off the ice at all times. Yeah, for sure. And the point that you bring up that you never know who's watching is so, so true. And you always have to behave well on the ice, give it your max effort. And off the ice, if a coach approaches you, like, you know, have good conversation, you know, answer the questions. Don't just, even if it's a coach, not a super high level, be respectful and all that. Don't just brush them to the side. It's very, very important because, and, and I've seen it at our, at our showcase that we hosted a couple of yeah. weeks, you know, coaches from, from not the highest and junior leagues would come approach players. And some of them were really nice. Others would kind of brush them off to the side. That's a big, big red flag that other coaches notice too. That is true. Cause I mean, it's such a small, a small world hockey is. And if you're talking to a coach and you definitely don't want to go there, you always got to be respectful because you don't know who that coach knows, right? Like he can know somebody two, three, four hires levels higher. Yeah. And now the guy calls you and you're like, what do you think about this guy? And I was like, well, you know, this happened when I was recruiting him. And, and so you never know what's going to happen. So you always, like you said, it's important to be professional and courteous with everybody you talk to and, and with wherever they're at. Right. Cause you don't know what's going to happen down the road. You don't know who people know. And I think it's super important. Couldn't agree more on that. And also to another point, you mentioned how they behave on the ice. You know, a big thing I tell guys like, don't slam the doors, don't slam your sticks, you know, don't yell at referees because even though you're, you're frustrated in the moment, find, find a way to kind of vent that frustration in a clean way, like hitting a guy on the ice or something like that. Because if you start slamming stuff, everybody sees it. Like I, I see it for me, it's an immediate turnoff. For, for yeah. I'm sure. It's the same for you too. Yep. You're, you're exactly right on that one. Yeah, for sure. Kind of moving away here and more transitioning into Norwich itself. So why do you got why do you think that Norwich has such a successful culture and such a successful program when it comes to hockey? So I think it's it's that small, that small town community feel where we're kind of the show in town, right? Like we there's you know, we're a small community, but the rink, you know, two thousand people at the rink. And so the guys walk into the rink, it's on campus, it's big, we have a lot of support. And I think historically, we've been very good. So when you combine those two things, and now you come in your Norwich, and then you take you take that success, and then you take that 
community that is behind the hockey program. And then you add, you know, the new culture and then you add the recruiting, you get the right guys. I think you, we just kept building off. And, and I know I've only been here for two years. The head coaches, this is his fifth year. When you build off that success and when you take things from other people, instead of trying to make your own thing, you know, against, <laughs> against all odds, right? Like you have to take some things from other places. And I think when you combine those three things, I think that's really what makes Norway successful. And I think treating the players the right way and, and making sure that they feel like they made the right decision and taking care of them on and off the ice and giving them a great experience because, you know, college is more than just playing hockey, right? You're going to get an education. You're going to meet some new friends. You're going to meet people in the community. So we really want you to have that well-rounded experience. And I think that we do it as well as anybody else does. And I think that, you know, there's, depending on where you're at, there could be good things and bad things. And we want to make sure that with what we have, we give you the best we can. What do you think are the the key things that at the college level that players can do to really succeed once they're at that level? Well, so, so everybody's at a level for a reason, right? Like maybe you're not the smartest player or maybe you're not the fastest player, or maybe you need to play harder. And I think it's once you get to college, like you need to really identify what you need to work on and, and then really go to that. So if you need to watch more film, come in and watch film. If you need to, to work on your shot, or you need to work and be harder, like putting the extra time off the ice and then really take advantage of the resources you have, like full-time strength coaches or go into a lot of video sessions or, you know, being around the guys more and, and making it that that real feel of like, I'm part of something and I want to build off of that. And I think a lot of times you come to a place and maybe you miss out on one of the aspects of why you're there. And when you miss out on that and you you don't get the full experience, I think getting that full experience and taking advantage of everything you have in front of you, I think that's really what helps you succeed. And the the part that you say in being around the guys more, that's something my freshman year, I wish I would have changed because I was very focused on like school, you know, on um, succeeding on the ice and all that. And it went quite well, but I didn't form like that really close bond until my second year with, with the guys until I realized, okay, like that's part of the college experience. It's, it's part of it's having fun, bond, making really close connections for life, you know, and that's yeah. what I missed out. So that's a really, really big part that a lot of people don't talk about. So I'm glad you brought that point up. Yeah. I think like, like you say that, right. It's, we're all going to be sitting here someday, regardless if you played in the NHL, you play D3, or you play wherever, right? So it's big, making those relationships. And if you're having, if you're having fun away from the rink, like even if you have a, you know, you're going to walk into a tough practice, like if you're having fun, it's going to make that practice better. And you're going to get more out of it because you're having fun in all aspects of, of your daily college life. Yeah, for sure. If you're, if you're, if you're happy and you're having fun, exactly. You just, you just perform better on the ice. I, I, I know this, like my, my third and fourth year at trying, like I had the most fun, a great group of guys and all that. And that's why I felt my game really went to the next level Yeah. before I was like more serious and all that, which is good, but you need a little bit of fun on, on, on you do. aspect too, you know, kind of transitioning back into the recruiting mode. Cause there's a few questions that I missed. I wanted to ask you is what leagues do you guys typically recruit out of, you know, as a top B3 program in Norwich? So I think we're, you know, mostly tier two leagues. I mean, in Canada and the U.S., we have a couple, a couple European guys, but they they went through the the junior ranks in the United States. You know, you can catch that occasional tier three player that's really excelled at his level, yeah. or he maybe got looked over and and now he's improved at an older age, right? So, but I would say ninety nine percent of the time, it's you know the NA, you know BC, CCHL, OJ. Those type of leagues we're getting guys from that are that are really going to excel at this level, and not to say that you can't do it from tier three, but there's a lot of teams at D three, right? So like if you're if you're competing to make the NCAA tournament every year, it's different than if you're competing to get better every year and you're starting from the you know the bottom or the middle and trying to get better. You're going to be able to take a few more tier three guys, and there are good tier three players out there that can play you know, at this level and, and be successful at this level. But I would say our recruiting starts at the tier two level and then we move, you know, down, down from there. Yeah. And that, that's, that makes sense. That's why I tell the players most of the time, like the high end D three programs, mainly all tier two and Canadian, like the good Canadian leagues. And, you know, you do get, like you said, the odd tier three player. It's not impossible, but you really have to dominate at that level or really fit a specific role that the coach is looking for. Mm -hmm. So that's that. But then for you, you guys are a top end program, right? The D3 level for a mid to lower end D3 program, then they'll take a few more D3 guys, like you said. Yeah, you know, it's, it's definitely it's not like if you go T3 or tier three that it's impossible to make it to WD3. It's just that you have to do very well if you go at that level. You do. You like if you're playing if you're playing tier three, you gotta be, you know, a top line guy 
or you need to be that guy that is a penalty killer or a hard worker, or you just got to find your niche at that tier three level to, to make the jump to D3. And it happens every day. I mean, I, I'm not sitting here saying like tier three, you can't play D3 because it happens all the time, but it does make it more difficult depending on, you know, what caliber of D3 team you're going to. Yeah. I got an interesting question for you. So sure. what's an example of a player that you've seen at the tier three level that really made like that stood out that really made you think like, Oh, I might like recruit this guy. I mean, honestly, like somebody that is willing to block a shot, that's willing to go in the corners, that's willing to penalty kill, that is the hardest working guy on the ice every time he steps on the ice, right? Because that that's the stuff that will translate from tier three to D3. The stuff that's not going to translate from tier three to D3 is the skill plays, playing in the soft areas, playing on the outside, because now you step up to D3 and everybody's bigger, everybody's faster, everybody is willing to do more things. Than, than some of the, the tier three. And I think the difference when you move to tier two and tier three is at tier two, when you play one through four lines, you're playing against one through four lines that are all capable of playing D3. And when you play at tier three, now if you catch the fourth line and you're on the first line, now you have, it's a mismatch, right? And it's, those kids aren't going to make the jump to D3. They're going to be, you know, an ACHA player probably, which is totally okay. And it's a great place to be. But you need to realize like, hey, I'm not facing the same competition every shift I touch the ice versus I am facing that competition every single time I touch the ice. And, and that's what makes that transition hard sometimes. If you're a skilled player at tier three, it takes you a little bit to learn like, hey, I got to be harder. I have to play in these areas. I need to go to the net. I need to do the little things that'll keep me in the lineup. Mm -hmm. And once you do that, and then you have the skill already, that's how you can stay in lineups. Yeah. hundred percent. So the, the take all message I'm getting here for, if you're a tier three guy, you want to make a, a really good D3 program, I would say compete, really compete every single shift, do the little things, you know, even if you're a skilled player, it's important to finish your checks, compete, do the little things like face off, shot blocking, all that stuff. Right. And by doing that, it'll really make you stand out. And the coach is going to notice that. And, yes. you know, you're going to have a chance to, to get recruited. So I think yeah, that's, that's what we notice. I'm not saying everybody does it that way. But, you know, from my perspective, that's what I want to see. And, and that's kind of like what we want to see here. Yeah. I feel like most NCAA D3 coaches notice that, though, because the D3 level is really, really physical. It's really com it competes hard. You know, there's only 25 or so games in the year. So they really compete hard. And. For me, I remember when I transitioned, it was a huge wake up call. It was uh, it was very, very competitive hockey. So um, if you if you do the, if you compete hard and if you do the little things right, I feel like most coaches notice that at the D three. Yep. So I guess Kevin, one last question I got for you to kind of wrap things up here is: What's like one piece of advice you'd like to give the young hockey players out there? Doing things the right way, approaching everything the correct way and trying to learn every time you do something right you can learn from your teammate you can learn from your coach being respectful and it's really just just about being an all-around good person that's willing to learn that's willing to help that wants to get better and, and wants to put the time in i think when you do all those things you know if you're if you're really young but if you're if you're going into juniors and doing that i would add on to it being aware of your opportunities being aware of your expectations and and really trying to explore as many options as you can like don't go into a season saying it's this or bust go into a season thinking hey like i'm going to do everything i can to play at this whatever goal it is for me and if i don't get there i'm gonna have a open mind and have a realistic expectations of i can get a really good experience at a lot of places and really identifying where those good places are and identifying where the places are that can make you a better player, can make you a better person. And sometimes it might not be always at the level you think it is. Yeah, 100%. I think that's a great final message. I think the the willingness to always learn and get better. I feel like if you have that driving force, that's going to make you that much of a better hockey player. And it'll translate in life too when uh, you get a job and all these things. It's, a, it's a, just a really good trait to have. So I think that's a, a great lesson to end on. Uh, Kevin, thanks so much for your time. I know you're busy recruiting guys all the time for your program there, so I won't keep you too long. It was a pleasure having you, and hopefully we can have you again sometime. Yeah, anytime. I had a great time on here. Thanks for having me. Uh, look forward to, to being on again. Awesome. Thanks, man.
Okay, thanks. All right, guys, that is it for the interview here. Hopefully you guys got some value out of it. I know I definitely did. If you did like this video, if you haven't already, consider absolutely destroying that like button. It really goes a long way here. Also too, if you're new here, consider hitting that subscribe button and notification bell so you never miss another video moving forward. If you have anything you wanna to talk to us about, anything whatsoever, consider dropping a comment down below or sending us a private email at info at ahadvising.com and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. All right, guys, that is it for the video here. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. We'll catch you on that next one.